Hi, I'm Mass Sergeant Joe Martell. I uh, just returned from Afghanistan and I'm in Brussels. Uh, surprised my son during his football game. Well, I don't know how to explain it, but I know the words will only do. Miracles with signs and wonders on enough for me to prove to you no. Don't you know I've always loved you Even before there was time Though you turn away, I tell you still you know I've always loved you And I always will Oh, yeah La, da, da. A greater love is not a man Than the one who gives his life to the root, yeah That he would do anything And that's what I'm gonna do for you, yeah Don't you know I've always loved you Even before there was time And though you turn away, I tell you still you know I've always loved you And I always will Oh, yeah da, da, da. I've always loved you And I always will La, da, da. Don't you know I've always loved you Even before there was time and Though you turn away, I tell you still yeah. Don't you know I've always loved you And I always will Oh, I've always loved you, yeah, and I always will. Da, da, da. We forget that when we were growing up, they were our first superhero. They were the ones that would give us that great big head start and race us and win every time. They were faster than the flash. They were the ones that would grab you and wrestle you and hold you and you would try to break free with all of your strength and you couldn't do it because he was stronger than the Hulk. He could open anything, lift anything, anything that you couldn't move, he could move with one hand. He could even touch the ceiling when you couldn't even jump to touch it. He was like Superman. Our dads were our heroes, would you agree? And. Uh, we don't know when exactly this happened, but somewhere along the way, we began to realize our fathers weren't, uh, weren't as super as we thought they were. They were just like every other dad, every other man. And when I became a father, I was told this, and I know this is true now, that especially if you have girls, Reed will say amen to this. Uh, your little girl thinks you walk on water until they enter that early teenage years, and then you're dumb as dirt. <laughs> and then they kind of come full circle around, and you're... You're the hero again. Um, what was that? That's just not girls either. That's not just girls either. Um, our dads were our superhero. But, um, and when we kind of like that because we like the admiration and 
And we like that feeling of that unconditional love and just being the hero. We like that. Um, the problem is God never called men or fathers to be superheroes. They called them to be surrogates. And we forget that. Um, I've read this this week. It says the difference between being a superhero and a surrogate is the difference between how we want to be perceived. And that will affect the way we raise our children. We will either seek to raise our children for our own glory or for the glory of God. And for many of us, we want our children to see us as superheroes because we crave their admiration and awe. We want to be seen as amazing and incredible as the super being in the galaxy. But what we should want eventually is we should want them to see their God, their heavenly father, as the most amazing, incredible super being in the universe. We are called to act as a surrogate, which is defined as a person appointed to act on the behalf of another. And in the case of fathers, we are appointed to a vocation that is akin to being the deputy for a king. So as fathers, we are called to the vocation of being a kingly surrogate. While we are not kings ourselves, the one true king has delegated to us some authority, power, and responsibility. Specifically, we are given authority over the children, which he has wonderfully and fearfully created with the hope that they will be part of God's royal family. And I said, you know, that's so true. Uh, even as a grandparent, I love being Superman. Just love it. It's just something about someone loving up on you for no reason at all. And so this morning, fathers, I want to say thank you, but I want to give you just a compass, if you will, uh, for tasks that God calls you to. We're going to look at various verses in our Bible this morning, but here's the four tasks. You ready? I want you to write this down, man. It's a provider, protector, prayer servant, and proclaimer. Those are the four tasks that God calls us to as men. And he called us to some of those from the very beginning with Adam. And then he called us to those other tasks later. But let's go to the Lord in prayer as we celebrate our fathers this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come into this place and we just celebrate these men, these fathers and these grandfathers, Lord, we want to encourage them and thank them and celebrate them. Father, I pray that as your word is open that we would not only be challenged, but those that are sitting around the wives and the children would be convicted about the tremendous weight and burden that fathers carry that they're unaware of. And fathers, we watch this video, how thankful we are that some of us probably wouldn't even be here today if our fathers hadn't saved us from harming ourselves. Lord, we thank you for fathers, and we thank you for you who are our Heavenly Father. Help us to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I don't know if you've noticed this, but um, God never calls us to a task He doesn't equip us for. He doesn't say, I need you to do this, and then doesn't give you the, the ability or power to do it. He doesn't say, I want you to achieve this and not give you instructions on how to go about doing it. And so He calls us to this high task of being a father. And I don't know about you, I look back and see how much I failed. Where I dropped the ball, where I did things wrong, if I only did it this way, if I hadn't have done that. Um, and I don't think the problem so much is that God didn't give us a blueprint or instructions as much as I probably didn't know the things I should have known. Now this isn't true just for us, this is true of the men in the Bible as well. The last two judges last two prophets, if you will, before the era of the kings, they had wayward children. Samuel was, was God's man. He'd been dedicated to God from a very young age. He was brought up among the priests and in the temple. He was, he was God's man, but his children were wayward. They decided to go their own way. King David was a man that's described as a man after God's own heart who teaches us how to pray and how to sing in the book of Psalms. And yet, his children really shipwrecked, many of them. And first, it, there's a couple of issues there. First issue lies in the fact that many of us assume that uh, God hasn't given us instruction, which isn't true. But the second issue is our children have their own decision to make concerning how they're going to follow Jesus and which kingdom they're going to be, belong to. But as a father, we have an example to follow. 
and it's the best example we have, and that's God, our Heavenly Father. God chooses to use the term for Himself, Father. And He does that for a reason. Now, as soon as I say that, some of you aren't fortunate enough to have had a good father. And I know that. Some of you had an abusive father, an alcoholic father, a drug-using father, an absent father. But let me share this. It's not fair to put all that on God. Just because He dropped the ball doesn't mean I can't see God as my heavenly Father. God uses that term because it's a term of intimacy. Matter of fact, if you're a student of your Bible, you will notice from the beginning to the end, God uses this term as Father for a reason. And sadly, instead of people saying, God is using this, let's try to understand it, they're doing this to our Bibles today. God's using that, we don't like it, so let's change it. We'll make it gender neutral. Like everything else is gender neutral. Sorry, there's male and female. You can live in your, you can put your head in the sand if you want to. We're different. Amen or oh me. And yet God chooses this term, Father. And men, if I were to teach you how to be better fathers, I think the best thing I could do is to show you who God is as our Father. He didn't choose this term lightly. It says, don't miss the hugeness of this statement. Father. It has a tremendous implication for us. Jesus said that our Father in heaven is a good Father. He is not too busy for you. He is not a deadbeat. He's not absentee and He's not disinterested. When we talk to Him, we know He hears. And when we pray and ask, we know He listens. And better yet, He always knows what is best for us and He provides our needs and shapes us and disciplines us like a good Father would His children. It makes him happy to do so because he delights in us. Actually, he desires and wants us. No one forced him to be begrudgingly take us in. And there is nothing we could have done to earn it. No amount of good deeds or determination to do better could bring us into the family of God. We are his because he created us and made us and sought us and saved us. Not because we were born into a certain family or country or bloodline but because from the very foundation of the world, he loved us and chose us and adopted us into Christ. That word adopt means that we are adopted into his family and that makes us children of God. And only a Christian can call God their father. So let us learn a little this morning about what it means to be a godly father. Number one, a godly father is a provider. Right at the very beginning of Genesis, when Abraham is sacrificing his son, God reveals himself to Abraham in a special way. And Abraham says of a place where he encountered God, he says, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. Meaning, that word means the Lord who provides. Literally, it means the Lord who sees and the Lord sees to it. He is the one who will see our needs and provides for us. The Lord will see to it that every need is met. God is the one who knows what my needs are, and because he sees it, he shall meet it. It says this in the New Testament. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and the glory of Christ. Now, when it's talking about supplying your need, we instantly think money. Fathers, you need to be a good provider. And some of y'all preach that to your families. I'm the provider of the family. That's my duty. But it goes much deeper than just money. When God provides for us, it's not just our needs and our shelter and our food and our clothing. It's wisdom. It's friendship. It's accountability. It's discipline. It's counsel. It's insight. He provides all of that. And dads, listen, he's provided your life. He's given your life. And because he's in it, your life should be fuller and richer because he is. Because God is a giver and he's not stingy when it comes to grace and empowerment and truth and security and counsel and friendship and wisdom. And so that's why Paul says in 1 Timothy, but anyone does not provide for his own, especially those of his household, has denied the faith and is worse an unbeliever. Let me ask you a question, fathers. Is your children's lives fuller and richer because you're in it? Because if we reflect God as our provider, I'm not talking just money, 
But if we reflect that and we do it in grace and in love and in truth, our kids will see that and their lives will be richer because of us. Fathers, we need to take that time and be intentional. I did not do this most of my parenting, and that's a little, I'm looking back and seeing all my mistakes. And so I'm trying to be a little intentional with being a provider. So Nikki, is Michelle here? She's not. Close your ears, sweetie. I don't want you to listen. <laughs> so what I'm trying to do now is every week I send them something to encourage them and make them laugh via text. Don't do it every week, but I'm trying. And it's funny because I'll send a different one to Michelle and a different one to Nikki and they'll compare notes. And they've got me in trouble because Michelle said, did you get the text from Larry? And Nikki goes, no. He's texting you and not me. Because what I'm trying to do is, is be there for them. Um, they know this, and they, I did do this right. If they come to me and want to know something, I will ask them this. Do you want to know the truth? And if they say yes, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell them the truth. Don't do it mean. I cut up with my kids. I play with my kids. I try every day, at least every day, to hug and kiss my kid. With Michelle, she's moved out of the house. I try to do it twice a week. Hope has seen me come in. Just come into Bella's, kiss, hug on her, and leave. Because I want to be a provider. Because that's the way my Heavenly Father is. Doesn't He send me encouragement every day? I know when I open this up, He encourages me. He chastens me. He disciplines me. Does God ever make you laugh? He makes me laugh. There's times I'll be walking and I'll just start laughing and Beth will go, what's going on? Because <laughs> I don't want to say, God just gave me a thought, I just thought it was funny. She'll think I'm crazy, I'm losing my mind. But he's a good father. So fathers, we need to be a provider. A godly father is also a protector. The psalmist says, I will lift up my eyes to the hill from where comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who's made heaven and earth. Think about that for a second. Your help comes from the one who created the entire earth and the entire heavens. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. You know, when we were watching that video and that little boy tripped and he was heading for the brick and the, and the dad caught him, do you think he's ever going to remember that? Not until he sees the video. Do you know how many times your heavenly father has kept you, protected you, and delivered you from evil and you never knew it? Amen. You never knew it. Mia's got a little, little gash on her head where she fell off the bed. And, and landed on that. She may have that, but I'm, we're hoping that will kind of fade. She knew that happened. But how many times have we saved her? Caught her? Did this, whoa, 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 stay right there. Don't move. And she's going, what? Our father does that and we never know it. We never know it. We're going to get to heaven and be shocked how our protector protected us. If you go through the names of God, and just for time's sake, I won't go through each and every one, but I won't give you the Hebrew name. And if you want the scripture verses for these, I can get them to you. Matter of fact, I may put them on the website to help you. Lord is, these are the names of God. Lord, my strength. Lord, the sword. Lord, mighty in battle. Lord, our defense. Lord, my refuge. Lord, my shield. Lord, my fortress. Lord, my deliverer. Lord, my high tower. Lord, strength in trouble. And so as fathers, when God calls you to be a father of your home, what you're, what you're to do is to be a covering, a shield, a protection for your family. And wives, let me share something with you. You don't have any clue what that even looks like until they're gone. Now let me tell you what I mean by that. You ask any widow how much their husband did for them. And they will say, I had no idea how much he was protecting me. They're lost. I didn't know we had this account, and I didn't know we were paying that, and I didn't know he was doing this, and I didn't know he had that. And, I don't, and they, and they kind of get panicked because all of a sudden, everything he was doing for them is now on 
them. And so church, that's why we need to minister to widows to help them through that. Sadly, it's only then that we realize how much our fathers were protecting us. They're cushions for our families. The Lord is good. Indeed, he is a fortress in time of distress. He protects those who seek refuge in him. And listen, dads, let me do something real quick. I'm going to show you something, men, so you can see this. And this may, this may flop. I may flop right here this morning because I didn't pre- preempt this, okay? Women, be honest. Do not be afraid. How often when you're out walking in a parking lot at night or home alone do you feel threatened and endangered? Raise your hand. Look at that, men. Now, we don't give two thoughts about that. We're walking in a parking lot and there's all these guys. We're like... But a woman does not feel that way. A woman becomes fearful. And that's just how they're wired. And men, we are to be their protector to make them feel safe. I didn't realize that until we were shopping in Fredericksburg. And Nikki cut me to the heart, Wayne. Cut me to the soul of my being. She, she emasculated me. Now listen to what she said. But she's given the heart of a girl here. We were in the parking lot. It was dark. We were sitting out there. It was me, Nikki, and Vincent. You'll remember this now. We were sitting in the parking lot, and these young bucks come walking by, and Nikki looks at me and goes, you know, I feel safer with him than you because you're kind of broken down. <laughs> now, this is what she meant. Now, listen. No, that's not an all. That's the truth. This is what she's saying. She's revealing the heart. I know if something happens, he will what? Protect me. And you know what I had to admit, Tiffany? She's right. Back's gone, buddy. I can't do much. You can only do so much karate with no back. <laughs> Women have a fear, and so do children. And men, you're to be the, cu- the cushion and the shield, the protector of the home, to protect them from those storms. We don't need to come home and be venting and complaining and nagging and Casting our weight upon them. We need to be a cushion for them. And so a godly man is a protector. Third point. A godly father is a praying servant. A godly father is one that stands in the gap with his family for prayer. Now let me share something with you. I'm going to beat up on you just for a little bit, man. But I'm going to beat up on everybody in a second as well. We live in a fallen world. Amen or amen. It is filled with trouble and stress and pressure and things aren't fair and people don't do right. They're seeking their own things. They don't want to do anything for others. You don't know who to trust and when to trust and all that. And while we're being the protector, we are carrying a lot of weight and a lot of burdens. And so things that we do to kind of cushion that to help us get through, and and I'm not picking, okay? This is just the truth. So in order to deal with all the weight and all the stress, sometimes we'll, we'll take a drag on a cigarette just to give me that <sighs> moment. You know what I'm talking about? Or when we get home, we're not getting drunk or anything, but we'll open up that beer just to get that <sighs> moment. Or the dip. Now before I throw that, let me share what some of y'all do. Coffees. We're running so hard and just need something to get me through, so I'm going to hit me some coffee, or better yet, a Mountain Dew. Let me share something with you. Mountain Dew is just as bad as dip. Sorry. It's not as nasty, but it's just as bad. (laughs) Do you know why, men, we go to things to help us get through? Because somewhere along the way, we forgot to cast our burdens upon him. So when we find out stuff about our kids, instead of carrying that all by ourselves, we need to take that and take it to the throne of Christ and lay it down at his feet. Father, I'm dealing with this today. Father, I'm dealing with this today. See, most men's prayer life consists of this. There's more month than money, God. I need some money. There's... There's this bill coming in and we're two months behind and I don't want my wife to know, Can you? I need a miracle. Give me a miracle. Or 
I've lost my job. Should, should I tell my wife or should I fake it? Should I just get up the next morning and act like I'm going to work while I'm looking for work? And we handle it all by our. And God says, no, you need to pray without ceasing and give it to me and trust me and let me help you. A godly man is a man who prays. We're to lift up holy hands is what the Bible says and pray without ceasing. Pray for your family and be intentional about it. Do you pray for your children or just when it's bad? Do you take the issues that your family's dealing with and pray for them and give them to God? Do you pray together as a family? I've learned something about my life. When I pray intentionally and I write it down and I wait with expectation for God to answer it, guess what God does? He answers it. But this is what I found out about me, not you, but me. I don't pray intentionally and purposely like I should. I kind of fall in the routine of if everything's going okay and the scope is set, I'm, I'm all right. But when things start to go bad, then I fall on my knees and I start to pray and God answers in a powerful way. Wouldn't he rather me be praying like that all the time intentionally and looking for the fruit of that long term? Let me tell you, you want to be a good parent? You'll be better not buying a parent book and getting on your knees and praying for your kids and being intentional. So what I've been doing the last couple of months, we've been doing this with our men's group too. We've been intentional with our, our prayer where we're writing down what we're praying and we're finding some Bible verses to back while we're doing that. And then we wait with expectation to have them prayer. Some of those prayers have been answered in a week. Some of those we're still waiting on. We should do that, men, for our families. And we should do it for ourselves. Amen. Well. As Forrest Gump would say, that's all I got to say about that. Last not least, a godly father is a proclaimer of God's truth with God's heart. Let me say that again. A godly father is a proclaimer of God's truth with God's heart. Do you know much of your New Testament is not commands to be obeyed or rules to be followed, but truths to be believed? Did you know that? If you ask people, most people, what is Christianity, they hear, well, that's where you got all these do's and don'ts and you got to follow all these rules. Most of our New Testament is truth to be believed about what Christ has done for you. To believe it. And then that truth, once it is believed in, is, is played out in how we live. God never says, here's the command, do it. He usually lays out the truth of why and then does it. Now, as a, as a godly father, I did a poor job of this. But there are things that he has said is true of my daughter. They're just true. If she's in Christ, these things are true of her. And if she would really believe that, 80% of her problems would go away tomorrow if she really believed the truth. You see, we are all wired to seek needs. We all have needs. Would you all agree with that? If you don't think so, why do we want people to like us so much? And some of you have been hurt in your life, and your goal is to make people hate you so much. That's because you got a need to protect yourself. You have a need to feel significant and important. You have a need to feel secure and at peace and safe. You have a need for a purpose. And God's truth answers all of that. And because we don't know that, we seek it in other things. That's called idols. Trying to fill those needs out there. Let me show you how this works. Many of us are damaged goods. Hurts that have shaped the way that we behave. It amazes me as a pastor how badly people act and they take pride in it. They're proud of how they are. Because they've been hurt in their life and it has shaped them. Some of us have suffered traumas and it has defined who we are. 
we see ourselves as worthless or white trash, whatever you want to call it. Some of us have had some huge failures in our life and has wrapped us up in fear that now controls us. And some of us have made some horrible choices and regret seem to cast a cloud over everything that we see and accuses us every day of, un of our unworthiness. And much of what has shaped us, sadly, is shaping our kids. Because the hurts and the scars and the things we did to ourselves or had happened to us, we project those right onto our kids and those patterns are passed down second, third generation, I believe. Let me give you an example. I was a very sneaky, lying, conniving person, Tiffany. I did a lot of bad things in the name of fun. Okay? And I hung out with criminal elements. Now let me tell you what criminal elements have taught me and how it has scarred me in my life. When your best friends are stealing and lying and hurting you, guess what you assume about everybody? The worst. You begin to have trust issues because the ones you called your friends have shaped you. That's why the Bible says good company can be corrupted by evil character, so to speak. So now I am in my 20s and my 30s. You want to know why I lock my car everywhere? I'm scars from my past. Do you know why I'm paranoid when I leave my house to go on vacation? Because I broke in the houses. Do you know why I don't trust a lot of people when they come over and I automatically assume they took something out of my house? Because that's what I used to do. Romans 2.1 says, you who judge, judge because you do the same things. Do you think I've projected any of that onto my kids? Amen or oh me, Nick. She just say it, amen. Every night before I go to bed, I make sure everything's locked. Every night before she goes to bed, guess what she's doing? Now, when she went off to Harrisonburg, she starts to get freed up a little bit because she would leave her apartment unlocked. And this is what I thought. Are you out of your mind? Do you know what kind of people are out there? Don't you watch the crime shows? <laughs> now, I laugh, but listen. Some of us are bitter, and we're passing that on to our kids. Some of us are arrogant, and we're passing that on to our kids. Some of us are control freaks, and we're passing that on to our kids. Some of us are paranoid, and we're passing that on to our kids. And a godly father is a proclaimer of God's truth and God's, with God's heart. What I should have been doing with my children is wiping the slate clean in my life so they could have a clean slate. Does that make sense? Am I making sense, church? Let me give you a story out of our Bible that explains this. In Genesis chapter 35, there's a woman who is dearly loved, and she's given birth to a son. As she is given birth to that son, her labor becomes hard. It says this, Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was, her soul was departing, for she had died. She's giving birth. She's dying in the process. She has the son. The midwife's comforter said, you're going to have this child. And she named his son Ben-Onai, the son of my sorrow. And she died. I praise God for a godly father. Because when he heard that, and I don't know if he did this intentionally or not. I think he did. He knew that would be a shadow over his child's life the rest of their life. You're, you're named the, the son of your mother's sorrow because you killed her. She died giving birth to you. You're indebted to her. The reason you don't have a son, I mean a mother's son, is because she died giving birth to you. And that would have cast a shadow over his entire life. It may have defined who he was. Would you agree? That's not what dad did. Dad comes behind and says this. His name is not that. It is ben Jamen, the son of my right hand. 
the son of my authority. He's the favorite. The one that will be my right hand man. Do you think that shaped Benjamin? To be a godly father means that you're providing not just financially, but friendship and counsel and insight and love and security. It means that not only are you providing, you're protecting them and cushioning them, letting them live in a happy world while you take on the storms of life so they can develop the way they're supposed to. A godly father is one that is praying and laying all these burdens upon the Lord so because he can't do it by himself and the Lord knows that. And you're proclaiming the truth to the next generation. I should have been doing more of this, Mary. You are wonderfully and fearfully made. And God's got a purpose and design for your life. Sweetie, it says so. And I can't wait to see what God's going to do with you. That's proclaiming the truth. Fathers, we're to use our life not for our own purposes, not to meet our own needs, but on behalf of our children. And the way we bless our children is focus on developing ourselves so we can be a blessing. We're surrogates, not superheroes. For one day we're going to transfer this child over to their heavenly father. Fatherhood is the best thing in the world. And dads, let me share something with you. This is just a tradition in the Baptist church. We praise mom and beat y'all up. You have the same title God your father has. Father. And the way we become good fathers is to learn more about our heavenly father and reflect that to our family. Amen. Dads, we love you. If I can have Alan and Kinston and Caleb and Jim to come up here just for a second. If you're a dad or a grandfather, I want you to stand up right where you are. And what we want to do is not just preach at you, but help you get there. Amen. And so what I want you to do is if you get this book, just sit down. This is just a devotional book to help you become more familiar with your Heavenly Father. Once you get your book, sit down. And this is a gift from the church family. Now, man, I know something about you because I've been working with y'all. Y'all don't like to read. It's only a page and a half. And it's for 90 days. So, man, let's do this. Put it in your car. Keep it in your glove compartment. Every time you get into your car, read that page and a half. Think about it. And at the end, you'll be able to say, I've read my first book. All right. I got it short and sweet for a reason. But the reason I'm giving you this is to challenge you to know your father better and to challenge you how you think about yourself. So, ladies, take your men out today and love on them. They've got a tremendous task for God. We're going to pray for them. We're going to close with him. 654. So let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll close with our hymn. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we leave here today. Many of us are going to dinner. Some of us are going home. Some, some fathers are going home to take a nap on the couch because that's what they want to do. <laughs> and Lord, I just pray that as we celebrate them, that we thank them for the times they caught us, the times they laid us down to bed at night with bad dreams, the times they took us fishing, the times they helped us heal up when we got hurt. And Father, you have given us a tremendous task when you created man in your image to reflect you, to be a provider, a protector, one who prays over and is a covering for their family and a proclaimer of the truth. Help us to come to know you so we can be the best fathers we can be. Help us to celebrate dads today. 
In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Hymn again? 654. 654. Let's stand and sing and just prayerfully sing this as we get ready to dismiss today.